an island designed by Trojan condoms, a gas gas man who surprisingly doesn't fart even once, and so much setup for the future I cannot process it all. Today I'm very excited to be talking about Punk Hazard. My One Piece watch along series returns from hiatus for the start of the Dressrosa saga, and this arc had a lot to appreciate, but I also have some criticisms that I'm eager to share. If you're new to this series, welcome. This is where I share my first impressions of the One Piece anime as I watch along for the first time, and occasionally gush buckets. With that said, let's jump right in, because this is surprisingly my longest script yet. At the beginning, this arc takes a couple of really weird twists and turns that are worth talking about. First off, the Straw Hats receive an emergency call from Punk Hazard talking about a samurai attack. Naturally, Luffy and me want to go check it out, but also Smoker, Tashigi, and G5 intercept that snail call and wiggle their way into being primary characters in this arc, and thank God. If you've been following me for a while now, you know that I love Smoker, and I was so excited to see him in this arc. Although this time around, it does feel like he took a backseat to Toshigi, which I was pleasantly surprised by. So, Nami creates a milky road from her borderline magic climb attack, and it allows the Mini Mary to travel over the flames of Punk Hazard and drop half the crew off. Luffy, Zoro, Robin, and Usopp touch down, and not long after, they have to fight a dragon, but this battle didn't really do it for me. All the characters were hyping it up like it was so crazy to see a dragon, but this is by far one of the least interesting creatures the crew has ever encountered. Think of all the goddamn weird beasts they've seen at sea. This dragon's got nothing on the massive sea monkeys. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew back on the Sunny are knocked out by some sleeping gas and kidnapped. Except for Brooke, who the hazmat team naturally believed to already be dead. I gotta be honest, after my little hiatus, I was worried that I had fallen out of my One Piece momentum and I wasn't gonna be as into the show anymore. It was an entirely illogical fear that I had for a few weeks, but after watching the first couple episodes of Punk Hazard, I did grow worried. That is, until episode 581. Only took me less than an hour of the show to get me back into loving this crazy weird world. In this episode, we meet a pair of talking legs that Luffy instantly asks to join his crew. It has some excellent setup with the revelation of the icy side of the island and a quick flash of a disturbing bird lady. Meanwhile, the other half of the crew that's been kidnapped spends a good deal of time playing around, reconstituting a head that's been cut to bits. Then, to top it all off, Luffy befriends a real centaur at the very end because he thinks Luffy is a fellow centaur due to him having attached the talking legs to his own back. What a payoff. While Luffy and the crew are fucking around on the hot side of the island for a little bit, I want to focus in on Sanji's squad that have been taken hostage. This is where the real story of this arc begins, and the fireside was more of a false start that barely has any relevance at all and mainly served just to split up the crew. The Severed Head claims to hate pirates and gives everyone a pretty hard time, but when the crew easily break out of the room, Sanji takes the head with him, rearranging it to reveal that it is the samurai, and... Don't you think I've stopped wondering what Sanji's deal is? You think I didn't pick up that he was familiar with Wano Country's hairstyles when no one else was? There is something going on with this kicking cook, and I will find out the truth. So the crew stumbles into a room filled with children, some of whom are massive, and things instantly get very sad. The samurai asks the children if they've seen a boy named Momonosuke, which is his son who he is looking for, but they obviously run away from the horrifying angry head toward the lovable cyborg, Super Frankie. I don't know why, but the joke of all the boys loving Frankie and thinking he's way cool while all the girls couldn't care less really lands for me. I find it quite relatable. With the guards chasing the Straw Hats, they have to flee the biscuit room, but the children beg for help, claiming that they aren't sick anymore and they want to see their families. This touches Nami, and she agrees to rescue the children. I want to say that while I don't love this storyline, this arc does a great job of involving Nami in the drama better than the vast majority of prior arcs. It isn't perfect, but it's something for her to do that comes from something central to her character. She can't ignore a child who calls for help because of her past, and so strap in because these kitties become integral to this arc. As they make their escape, Sanji and Frankie hold off the guards, and I really like this duo. It doesn't happen too often, but they actually have a great fighting dynamic. Brings me back to the C train before Annie's lobby, which was badass as hell. Anyway, let's check in on the other parties involved. Luffy's group has been told about the crew being taken to the cool side of the island by Brooke, 
who is just chilling on the sunny, and so they head over across the massive lake in the middle. Say goodbye to the fire half of Punk Hazard, because this incredibly dope setting that could be utilized to mix up the environment and keep things fresh will be entirely squandered from here, as the rest of the arc is just in snow or a bland lab surrounded by purple. One more critique before moving on. I've been struggling to articulate why Usopp's plants don't resonate with me, and I think seeing the banana boat plant helped me to figure it out. I don't like his plants because he didn't make them. One of my favorite aspects of Usopp's personality was that he was this tinkerer who would make wacky and absurd gadgets that were innovative and showed off his intelligence. Now he's just using things that he's found, which is interesting and still shows off his creativity, but I don't think it's as fun and I don't think it highlights his character traits as well. If he was mixing it up, combining plants and gadgets or using them 50-50, I think I'd like it more. I don't know, this was a weird tangent, but I didn't have anywhere else to put it. Meanwhile, G5 has entered the waters of Punk Hazard, and we are told some juicy, juicy info. Punk Hazard is the island where Aokiji and Okainu fought for the fleet admiral position, and that is why the island is split in half by these two weather systems, which is incredibly badass. Apparently, there was an accident on Punk Hazard years before that fight, which made the island uninhabitable. And there is a secret research base that Smoker wants to check out. And look at this. Smoker has got his cigars in the pipe of his gas mask? How could I not love this man? They come to the doors of the lab, and none other than Trafalgar Law answers. I knew it. Once I saw that cut-up face, I knew Law somehow was involved based on what we saw of his weird-ass powers at Salbody. But, 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 now, he's a warlord! Obviously, we don't know much about Law before his reintroduction here, but we do know enough that he isn't going to be the standard villainous warlord like we have seen before, which already adds a unique angle to this arc. But we are told Law did some pretty fucked up shit to get this position, bringing the navy the hearts of 100 pirates, so he's pretty dedicated to whatever his plan is. By this point in the story, it's impossible to even guess what Law is up to, but I love how Oda utilizes him, taking a familiar character, putting him in a familiar role, but in a situation that keeps us guessing. But we do find out some things about Law here. Finally, we learn what exactly his devil fruit power is. He ate the op-op fruit. He's a modification man and can essentially operate on whoever or whatever he wants within a limited space, his operating room. That's why he's able to slice and reattach people at will, but we also see in this fight with Smoker that Law is able to manipulate the environment to some degree and surgically remove people's hearts without them dying, which will be extremely important throughout this arc. However, before we get into that fight, Nami's group bursts out of the lab with the children. Naturally, they turn tail and run at the sight of Smoker, but we see that Law can switch people's hearts, and he Freaky Fridays the whole group as they flee. We'll get back to that shortly. So after this, Smoker and Law have a pretty decent fight, but it's clear Law is out of Smoker's league. That's going to be a reoccurring theme throughout this arc, because unfortunately, it looks like we've entered the stage where Smoker's power just isn't enough anymore, and he has his heart removed by Law. It's here that Luffy's crew finally arrives on the scene. Having run into some annoying centaurs led by the lazily named Brownbeard, who they beat the crap out of and rode to this side of the lab after picking up Brooke. Luffy thanks Law for saving him after Marineford, and Law says he has to get going and will speak to Luffy again soon. Then he Freaky Friday Smoker into Shigi, just for the fun of it. Back with Nami's group, everyone is getting acquainted with their new bodies. Nami is in Frankie's body, Frankie is in Chopper's body, Chopper is in Sanji's body, and of course, Sanji is in Nami's body. This show just can't miss an opportunity to show off some glistening jugs, and Nami's body becomes a feast for her own eyes, as Sanji simply cannot resist how horny he has become for himself. If that's confusing, luckily, everyone begins to wear a little headband to show who they really are, which I thought was pretty charming. With everyone in the cold and freezing, the samurai reveals that he has acquired a strange power after eating a mysterious fruit, and tells the striats to put a rock on their heads, which he can transform into clothes. This is a really interesting hint about Wano Country. If a samurai doesn't even know what a devil fruit is, something I think literally every single person knows about, then Wano must be really cut off from the rest of the world. Anyway, Luffy's group arrives and the Straw Hats are reunited. They all touch base on what the hell has been going on, and unfortunately, Luffy has to give up his new pair of legs to the samurai so he can attach his head to them. This is when Brownbeard begins to tell them all about his master. This isn't the first time we've encountered Brownbeard. No, no, no. He was featured at the very end of the post-war arc 
getting fucked up by the arrival of the worst generation, who he despises. That is how he lost his legs, and he loves his precious master oh so much because he gave him animal legs, with the help of Law, who, you know, is part of the worst generation, but I guess that doesn't matter. The master is a prominent scientist who, after a horrible accident four years ago, took in those paralyzed by nerve gas and helped them walk, and later helped Brownbeard's crew. Brownbeard would do anything for his generous master, including capturing the Striats to be experimented on. On the other side of the island, Smoker, in Toshiki's body and of course rocking her exposed knockers as much as he can get away with, but to be fair, Toshiki has Smoker's sweet abs bundled up, tells us another story about this master. Smoker says that it was Caesar Clown, the master and a gas gas man, who set off the incident four years ago on purpose and was arrested for his crimes, but escaped. If he is continuing his experiments, it could only mean bad news for the world. Fairly soon after this, it's revealed that the children the Strats saved were experimented on to grow to their ridiculous size, and have become chronically addicted to a drug Caesar was feeding them in the guise of candy to make sure they could never escape from him. They begin suffering from withdrawal and become powerful rage machines with an insatiable sweet tooth. Um, yeah, that is horrifically fucked up and Caesar is an absolute monster. Let's go punch him in the face and stop his horribly annoying laugh that threatens to make the world's ears bleed. Yep, we have another annoying laugh. While it isn't worse than Moria's based on the sheer sound, he laughs so much more often and seemingly for no reason that the sheer frequency alone is enough to drive me crazy. <sighs> All right. Let's cool down. Caesar Clown has sent the Yeti Cool Brothers to take down the Straw Hats, and I've got to say, these guys are pretty one note, but I absolutely love their obsession with being cool. As their name suggests, they are these massive yeti creatures whose faces are always in shadow. They take down Zoro, Sanji, and Brook with sleeping gas who have gone off in search of the samurai. Then they burst into the Strats hideaway and absolutely fuck up Brownbeard, shooting him at point blank range in an attempt to kill him. The bros then kidnap Nami in Frankie's body, who remains utterly useless, not even trying to use the living weapon she resides in. I mean, this was a golden ticket to get her to do something, but no, she is just the damsel in distress while Luffy and Frankie, who himself is doing something in Chopper's body, go to save her. They do so fairly easily, and the Yeti Cool Brothers are never seen nor heard from again, which I was pretty disappointed by. There was so much mystery with their faces. Who were they? What were they? I guess we'll never know, which is pretty uncharacteristic for this series. I was expecting them to pop up throughout the story, but I guess they probably died? Anyway, Law's here. An alliance is formed. Law offers to partner with Luffy in order to take down one of the four emperors, and once again we get some bullshit where the audio of which emperor is kept from the audience. It's annoying, but technically irrelevant for this arc, so we'll move past it. The first step of the plan is to kidnap Caesar Clown, something Luffy is more than eager to do, while Law helps Chopper sneak into the lab in order to come up with a cure for the children's drug withdrawal. Law switches Frankie and Chopper back into their original bodies, while Nami gets stuck in Sanji's body, and the group split up. Meanwhile, Caesar has decided to release his pet on the hot side of the island, a giant slime that is the physical embodiment of the explosion from four years ago. Smoker and Toshigi are fighting alongside G5 against Caesar's goons, and Law and Chopper are about to enter the lab. Everything seems to be going according to plan, until Luffy, Robin, and Frankie come crashing down onto the battlefield, and Luffy happily declares he's here to kidnap Caesar, to Law's utter shock. This is a reoccurring element throughout this arc, Law getting to know how Luffy operates and continuously being surprised and disappointed at his sporadic nature, and I love it. This arc solidified to me how shady, calculating, and generally badass Law is, which is contrasted with Luffy's brash spontaneity. Toshigi in Smoker's body then tries to take on Luffy, who handles her pretty easily now that he's mastered hockey, but Smoker in Toshigi's body steps up to fight, although when Luffy realizes what's going on, he starts cracking up. He tells them to chill out so everyone can have a rematch in the future when they're all in their bodies. Very classic shonen attitude, but that's what I'm here for. It's here that the slimes start raining down, and honestly, they bore me, so I'm just gonna move on. Caesar shows up in the middle of the action to start gloating about his slimes, and Luffy eagerly smacks into him during his evil villain monologue, which I also loved very much. Whenever Luffy can take the piss out of these pompous villains is a win in my book. 
Caesar then tries to hit Luffy with some poison gas, which of course he's immune to because that was conveniently established in the previous arc. In this moment, I thought that Caesar was toast. He had tried all his tricks, and there was absolutely nothing he could do to stop Luffy. I was dead wrong. Suddenly, Luffy begins to choke and goes down hard. Everyone else, Robin, Frankie, Tashigi, and Smoker, soon join him, and I was very confused. I had no idea what was going on, and what we see happen to Law around the same time only added to my confusion. Law had infiltrated the lab and split up with Chopper when he also began to suffer from some invisible attack. He goes down, clenching his heart, and a man named Virgo arrives out of the shadows. At this point, I was beyond dumbfounded. How did Law get wrecked so easily? Does he have his heart removed too? Who is Virgo, and why does he have a piece of meat stuck to his face? Good thing we're about to get a hell of an exposition dump. With everyone who was taken down by Caesar and Virgo now in a prison cell with sea stone prism handcuffs, we get some damn answers. The first one is that Virgo is a vice admiral of the Navy and the leader of G5. AKA, he's Smoker and Tashigi's boss, which I think was such a great idea. This gives Smoker and Tashigi a real dog in this fight in a way they've never had in prior arcs. Their primary motivating force has always been to catch the Straw Hats, which is fine, and I love them for that, but it was time for something fresh. This was an absolutely brilliant way to form a temporary truce between the Straw Hats and G5 in order to fight a common enemy who they are personally invested in taking down because of their own philosophies. But the big reveal here is the man who Monet, Caesar, and Virgo have been working for. The man who's been pulling all the strings, the underground criminal mastermind Joker, is motherfucking Don Quixote do Flamingo, the last warlord. Let's fucking go. I'm ready for this one. Law then tells Luffy that he used to work for Doflamingo, which hints at what he's been scheming on Punk Hazard. He clearly has some kind of vendetta because he doesn't have the nicest relationship with Virgo. So, with the bulk of the enemy captured, Caesar goes to collect the children from the Straw Hats hideout. He easily deals with Usopp and Namji, but oh joy, Brownbeard is still alive because of reasons, and he gets confronted as well. I'm going to have to rant about Brownbeard in a little bit, but I'll hold off for now because my anger only multiplies. Somehow, this raging buffoon survived a point-blank gunshot from Caesar's star assassins, and now, to add insult to injury, Caesar completely rips into him, showing him that he isn't the kind master that Brownbeard thought. Then Caesar adds injury to insult after so much injury has already been endured and blows Brownbeard, Usopp, and Namji up. Caesar takes the drug-addled kids back to his lab to continue his experiments, but one child snaps out of things. Back with the prisoners, it's revealed that as part of the deal for allowing Law to stay on Punk Hazard, Caesar demanded his heart as insurance and was given Monet's heart in good faith. That is why Virgo was able to take Law down easily. He has his heart and can give it a little squeeze to stop him dead in his tracks. Also, Caesar now has Smoker's heart, so everyone is pretty much screwed. This is when Caesar's plan kicks into high gear. He's going to use Smiley to unleash an updated version of the gas attack that destroyed the island four years ago, and he is broadcasting the event to the underground so they can see the effects of his weapon, which I'm sure will be available at a reasonable price. I really like the idea of these underground networks. Feels much more modern than most of One Piece with everyone watching from around the world. What exactly they're seeing this whole time is beyond me, because this goes on for a while, but that's besides the point. We see Big Mom's crew watching the transmission, a few other random people I'm sure will be important, and Captain Kid's here. Smiley eats a big piece of candy, and a chemical reaction causes him to burst into gas, but right before that, a fruit in a nearby cart turns into a devil fruit. I'm still really unclear on if Caesar somehow did this, and if so, what the point would have been. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to know yet, or if it ever comes up again, but this was very intriguing. Anyway, with literally the entire island under threat of a chemical attack, let's check in with our crew. First off, the prisoners are still locked up, but Caesar wants to use them to show how effective the Shinokuni gas is, and he dangles them outside so they can die. The group of Zoro, Somni, and Brooke finally caught the samurai's frozen head and legs, which were paralyzed because his torso fell into the lake. Somni jumped in the water to save him, and honestly, I really love how responsible he feels for the samurai. He doesn't necessarily even like him, but he's the one who decided to free him, and he's the one who has to bear the burden of keeping him safe. He dives into the water while slime bits rain down on Zoro and Brook. It's here that I think we get to see the first instance of Sanji purposefully using hockey, which was really interesting and helped him to catch that torso. With the samurai complete, we find out that his name is Kinemon, 
also known as Firefox, and he can burn shit with his sword attacks, which seems to be a samurai technique completely separate from his closed devil fruit ability. Zoro is immediately very intrigued by this, and the group sets off together to find Kinemon's son, but things quickly go wrong for them. They get caught up in Smiley's gas explosion and run in the most cartoonish ways I've ever seen Zoro and Sanji behave. They are hauling ass for their lives, and it's comedy gold. Meanwhile, Namji, Usopp, and Brownbeard all survive Caesar's attack and are just fine. They also start running for their lives, and it's here that once again I have to complain about how death is treated in this series. I get that Oda doesn't want to kill characters very often, and that's totally fine. I'm not some bloodthirsty maniac edgy 13 year old who needs blood and gore in all of my stories for them to feel hardcore and real. My issue in this instance is something that happens again and again in this series, but is so aggressive with Brownbeard that it's unforgivable. In cases like this, I don't care how strong the character is. The defense that Brownbeard is actually stronger than people thought, so that's why he survived, is besides the point. My criticism is the laziness of the writing, to be unable or unwilling to create drama or stakes that isn't, oh shit, he's dead, if you're not going to stick with it. It's okay once in a while, but Brownbeard got shot at point blank range by people we are told are serious assassins. No one defended him, he was chained up, he might as well have been sleeping. We are then led to believe he died, but in a surprise, he turns out to have survived. That's fine, I get it, but the fact that he's immediately hit with another insanely powerful attack that was meant to kill him again, and he's just fine again, is ridiculous. If your go-to for creating drama is to show people getting hurt so badly that you trick the audience into thinking they're dead, and it never means anything, your drama is completely meaningless and loses all impact going forward. Yes. I guess, technically, Brownbeard could survive his two attempted murders, but the fact that he has to deal with two attempted murders back to back causes me to have no investment in him as a character anymore. Alright, there's my rant. I know some people do not care, but it really bothers me when this happens. Moving on. It's finally time for everyone to converge on the lab and do some ass kicking. While in their cage, Law lucked out by getting a pair of non-seastone prism handcuffs, which he had planted throughout the facility, and that I thought would be relevant later on, but the story didn't feel like following up on that plot thread. Frankie causes a distraction while Law uses his powers to save everyone, including Smoker and Toshigi. They get their bodies swapped, this crew breaks free, and Frankie farts off into the distance to go take care of the Sunny. Such a glorious sight. Namji, Usopp, Zoro, Somni, Brook, and Kinemon meet up and use Brownbeard's half-dead but still kicking centaur body to escape the incoming gas attack. Luffy and crew get inside the lab and allow the G5 soldiers to enter, who then seal the door, but Zoro and Kinemon slice it wide open so everyone can enter at the last second. Of course, G5 scrambles like madmen to reseal the wall and keep the gas out, but everyone is reunited and it feels so good. Now, we are about to experience another classic Straw Hat split off showdown, so I'm gonna hop around a bit and things are gonna be less linear. First up, we have the start of the counterattack. Smoker tells his men not to worry about the Straw Hats, and we have a temporary alliance where I think a lot of the charm of this climax comes from. Luffy takes off to catch Caesar, Smoker goes to kill Virgo, and Law fades into the shadows up to his own scheme. Caesar sees what's going on and says, fuck it, unleashing the gas into the lab, which causes every single character to be running for their lives until the end of this arc. Virgo, whose gag of being forgetful and constantly getting stuff stuck to his face has become pretty funny, goes off to find Law. Meanwhile, Chopper has found Mocha and treated her drug-addled mind. He then convinces her to join him in preventing the other children from eating any more pieces of candy, and I do have some problems with the storyline that I'll speak to in a moment. Now, let's talk about the surprisingly fantastic Luffy vs. Caesar fight, round two. Luffy busts into Caesar's HQ, trying to kidnap him once again, but Caesar proves to be a trickier opponent to combat than he initially appeared. When he took everyone down earlier, he did so by removing the oxygen from the air and just choking everyone out. Now that Luffy knows what's up, the fight gets a lot more interesting, and I have to give Oda some serious credit for the layout of this battle. Visualizing where oxygen is or isn't seems like it'd be an extremely tough feat, but he managed to come up with a brilliant way to do so. There are flames on the battlefield. First, because of the friction Luffy created by running so fast to get here, and then when Caesar uses his Gastonet attack on Luffy. We are able to tell where there's oxygen based on where there is or isn't fire, 
and I love that idea. The fight itself is pretty entertaining, and I actually wish it went on for a little bit longer. Once Luffy seems to have the upper hand, Monet steps in and reveals she's a snow snow person and traps Luffy in her big ol' snow dome. The only way for him to escape is to break the floor and fall into the garbage disposal Star Wars style, so we'll get back to Luffy much later. While the groups are all running away from the Shinokuni gas that is seeped into the facility, Vice Admiral Virgo arrives, much to G5's delight. We are told that the misfits of G5 view Virgo as a father figure, and through flashbacks, we see that even Tashigi really looked up to him. When he begins attacking his own men, G5 refuses to believe that this is the real Virgo, and Tashigi doesn't have the heart to tell them the truth. I really like that she gets some spotlight in this arc, and this is an excellent scene, even if it is a small moment. Tashigi can't handle Virgo, but when there's a lady in need, there's a Sanji indeed. Our leggy boy zoots in and takes Virgo on solo in order to protect Tashigi, and he's essentially the leader of G5 from here. His fight with Virgo doesn't last very long. Sanji holds his own for some time, but we see that his bones are literally cracking from the impact, so it's a good thing an emergency broadcast comes in, warning Virgo of what Law is up to, and he takes off. From this point forward, Sanji is a comedy character for the rest of the arc, and I think he works well fawning after Tashigi and integrating himself among G5. He kicks everyone's asses trying to save them, and eventually, he runs into Zoro, who he leads G5 in mocking in a downright hilarious way that may just be the best comedic moment of the whole arc. That brings me to the poor, innocent children. Chopper has held back the angry kids for enough time that Mocha has been able to go to the biscuit room and gather up all the pieces of candy to keep from her friends. However, Chopper is unable to keep them at bay, and soon they corner Mocha and try to get the candy from her at any cost. Nami, Robin, and Zoro arrive to try and quell the kids so that Chopper can treat them, but they prove to be a bit too much to handle while not using serious force. This is when Monet arrives, but Zoro steps up to handle her. I will get back to the Monet fight in a minute, but Mocha makes a break for it with the candy and is chased by the other children. Chopper, Nami, and Robin go after them to try and stop things, and we get some flashback insight. We see that Chopper told Mocha that due to the experiments that they have endured, none of the kids are likely to live to adulthood, which is truly heartbreaking and deeply upsetting, but also, I doubt that will be the case. This story isn't one for tragic outcomes, especially not for innocent children, so I'd put all the money in the world that everything works out for these kids. And once again, that's a consequence of always establishing false consequences, but I'll shut up. Anyway, Mocha is driven by her desire to make sure that her friends are okay, so she won't let them get their hands on the candy no matter what, but honestly, I don't get all the fuss about letting the kids eat the candy. I get why Mocha, as a child, would see things this way because she was told by Chopper to do this, but like one more piece isn't gonna do any serious harm and it would solve this whole situation way quicker and with no consequences. The kids have been taking this drug every day. It's designed to get them addicted, not to harm them. As far as we're told, this isn't the experimental treatment, it's just an insurance policy. So, if the kids ate the candy, their furious state would end and Chopper could treat them, or use the opportunity to escape the facility and then treat them. Of course, everything works out. But there's no way these characters could know everything would work out, especially with poison gas closing in on delusional children. This entire shit show could have been averted just by letting the situation play out, but of course, things become a real clusterfuck when Mocha decides to eat every single piece of candy and overdoses. With the candy gone, the newly arrived G5, led by Sanji, treat the rest of the children and Chopper takes Mocha for emergency care. So, back to that confrontation between Monet and Zoro. Monet tries to stop the Straw Hats from interfering with the kids, but Zoro steps between them. It's in this scene that we directly see Zoro use Haki purposely for the first time, as now he is more than capable of cutting a Logia-type Devil Fruit power holder. Monet isn't playing around and goes to attack Robin while she's running away, stabbing her right through her shoulder. This has no lasting effect though, because why would it? Monet then goes after Nami as well, but is stopped by Zoro. In this moment, this arc does the exact thing I wanted from the last arc. Monet calls the others weak and says she's gonna take care of them first, 
but then Nami delivers a heat attack to show her what she's made of, doing some decent damage before running away. Thank you, that's all I needed. Here is when Sanji and G5 arrive to deliver the most perfect in-passing fuck you I've ever seen. They all go hubba hubba for Monet's yabos, then Toshigi enters the fight, saying she will help Zoro since he doesn't have what it takes to beat Monet. Sanji and G5 chase after the kids, and Toshigi expands on what she thinks about Zoro. We flash back to their first confrontation in Logtown, when Zoro refused to fight Toshigi because she reminded him so much of his friend from childhood. Toshigi thinks that Zoro views women as inferior, and that he won't do what it takes to stop Monet because he never properly fought her. I find this to be a really interesting dichotomy between how Toshigi views Zoro and how Zoro has been presented to the audience, and I think it really informs Toshigi's mindset in a way that I appreciate. I also think that she's dead wrong. At his absolute worst, Zoro has a soft spot for women because of his friend and the self-hatred she had for being born a woman in a man's world. Toshigi clearly harbors that same self-loathing, and it isn't hard to see. But Zoro isn't Sanji, and he'll cut a bitch if he has to. Although, after all of this, I still can't tell if Zoro could bring himself to kill Toshigi if he had to, but maybe that's the ultimate end of their relationship. It does seem like a fitting ending to Toshigi's character arc, to be killed in combat by a superior warrior who respects her as a warrior and doesn't hold back because she's a woman. It would be a bittersweet ending between these two master swordsmen, and I think I'd die from dehydration after the fact, but that's just my random theory that has nothing to do with what's going on. Toshigi puts up a decent fight against Monet, but Zoro saves her ass and fucks with Monet's head so hard she absolutely loses her mind from fear. He does spare her life though, and Toshigi comes in to strike the finishing, but not not deadly last strike. The duo then run off, with Zoro carrying an injured Toshigi in the wrong direction, and god damn it, why do I like this bit so much? It's made all the better with Zoro running straight toward the gas, while Toshiki desperately tries to backseat drive him in the right direction. Meanwhile, Virgo is making his way to Law's position, and he calls Doflamingo, who is more insane than I even expected. During their entire conversation about stopping Law's scheme, Doflamingo is just casually evading attacks by a woman in a maid outfit named Baby Five, who is trying to kill him because he killed her fiance. The the confrontation ends when he somehow controls her body and forces her to raise her own gun to her head. This man is a loon, and I'm here for it. So Virgo confronts Law, whose heart he still has, and he easily takes down the sullen pirate. However, Smoker finally arrives on the scene. In the anime, this fight is teased out in bits and pieces for far too long in my opinion, but when it finally goes full throttle, I thought it was very well animated. Smoker is pissed that Virgo has been undercover all these years, and that he betrayed the honor of the Navy, something his pride won't allow him to stand for. Yet, Smoker is getting his ass beat this whole time. It's kinda crazy to see just how outclassed he is with a fellow Vice Admiral, but it does seem like Virgo is an exceptional hockey user, able to harden his entire body at once. Smoker realizes this and puts it all on the line, spreading his smoky body apart, making himself an even bigger target for Virgo, also that he can secretly steal Law's heart back and return it to him. I absolutely love this moment for Smoker, but the cherry on top is how easily Law takes down Virgo afterwards, instantly slicing through him and like, this entire mountain range with one clean motion. <clears throat> the whole mountain range! I thought his power was limited to his room. Does that mean his room has that kind of insane range? Law and Smoker then leave Virgo's completely chopped up body in the SAD room that is ready to explode, but right before they leave, Virgo drops some vague hint about Doflamingo's mysterious past. Ooh. If this whole fight did anything, it's get me more excited to learn more about this flamingo freak. And we wrap up our little marathon through this bland ass lab by going back to a staple of early One Piece, something that we actually haven't seen since I think Water 7. Luffy getting stuck in order to take him out of the action and delay his fight. Oh yeah, that fits like a glove. Luffy is stuck in the trash compactor or whatever, but here he actually comes across a vital character to the story arc and unknowingly progresses the plot. So this is an incredibly mature upgrade to the old formula, and I tip my hat to you, sir. Luffy meets Momonosuke, Kinemon's son, who has been transformed into a dragon by an artificial devil fruit? Okay, hold the fuck up. We have to talk about this. I thought I'd never see the day, and frankly, 
I'm scared. We are told that Vegapunk made a clunky artificial devil fruit back when he used to run the lab, and Momonosuke ate one, so now he has janky dragon powers. This brings me to talking about SAD and Smile, which is at the heart of what this arc is really about, and fully changes everything about the One Piece world. When Law takes Virgo down with Doflamingo listening in, he claims that stopping SAD manufacturing would break the gears of the new world, and with everything we learn about this underground operation, I don't think he's being overly dramatic. Caesar uses his gaseous brain to manufacture SAD, through which he can create artificial devil fruits of his own known as Smile, but they are all zone-type fruits. He creates these for Doflamingo, who then sells them on the black market. Rumor has it, to one of the four emperors who's amassing an army of these Smile users. Law wants Caesar kidnapped to throw off this whole arrangement and fuck over everyone involved. When I heard this information, naturally I was trying to piece together which emperor it could be. Shanks was out, and from what we've seen of Big Mom, it just didn't seem to fit with her either. Before it was revealed who it could be, my choices were Blackbeard or the mysterious Kato. At this point in the story, we don't know anything about Kato, but we do know that Blackbeard is a fucking lunatic who will do whatever it takes to scheme his way to the top, but this just didn't feel like his style. Also, Luffy already has beef with Blackbeard, so this isn't needed to progress that. So, by process of elimination, I figured it was Kato. Another useless tangent. So Luffy and Momonosuke are stuck, but the little dragon who could starts climbing up some clouds with Luffy hanging on until he passes out, and then Luffy takes over from there. Meanwhile, Brownbeard the Unkillable confronts Caesar with the intention of telling his men everything about how Caesar doesn't care about them and just considers them guinea pigs. I do want to say that while Caesar is annoying, I actually think the writing for his character is pretty entertaining. When I eventually read the manga, I feel like I'll enjoy him a lot more without having to hear his damn voice. He is a textbook manipulator, lying to everyone he can at every chance that he can, and he gets great pleasure from it. Of course, he is surrounded by complete morons, so he does have it pretty easy. Brownbeard tries to warn everyone, but Caesar injects him with a muscle relaxer and he can't form a proper sentence. He begins to lash out and Caesar orders him shot, saying he must have been manipulated by the Straw Hats. So. To add insult to injury to insult to injury to insult to injury, Brownbeard is riddled with bullets by a firing squad of his peers. Collapsed on the ground and somehow still alive, Caesar goes to unleash his Gastonet attack and says, Now, let me finish him off. Now? Now? This man's been through enough! Luckily, Luffy hits him with an elephant gun, just in time to save Brownbeard, and the final battle begins. It's here that we get all the talk about SAD and Smile, but I couldn't hold it in, it was too interesting. Unfortunately, this fight isn't as interesting as the previous battle. Caesar absorbs the Shinokuni that is leaked into the room, which is pretty stupid, because if he just let it flow like normal, it would have been way more effective. But we needed to make the similarities to Moria crystal clear and give Caesar his own final big transformation that ultimately amounts to nothing. A lot of Punk Hazard feels like Thriller Bark, actually. They show up on an island of wacky mythical creatures that all get explained away by a devil fruit power, and they spend the rest of the arc in the villain's lair. Just another random thought. However, we are told a couple of times throughout this arc that Caesar is the type of man who Luffy hates the most, both by Sanji and Usopp, and this is when their dichotomy comes on full display. Caesar has stopped pretending that he cares about his men, and begins attacking them with his Shinokuni powers, which infuriates Luffy. Luffy cannot stand a leader who abuses his own people, and we have seen a number of times throughout this arc just how much faith Luffy has in his crew, and how far he will go to protect them. We already know this about Luffy, so it isn't new info, but it is a nice element of the story. Luffy then smashes Caesar with the Grizzly Magnum, which seemed to be Gum Gum Bazooka with third gear hardening, and it sends Caesar flying. With that, the fight is finished. Keep in mind, this whole thing was somehow televised to the underworld, and I think Luffy beating Caesar's ass for all to see is a fun way to spread word throughout the world of what went down here. But it's not over yet. Super! Fuck yes, Battle Frankie is back in the action, and he starts fighting Doflamingo's two assassins, the maid from earlier named Baby Five, which makes me think there are other numbered babies out there, and this absolute creep, Buffalo. During the goon flight over to Punk Hazard, we learn that Baby Five cannot say no to anyone, and my first thought was that Sanji is really gonna love this cigarette smoking babe. Unfortunately, or probably more like fortunately for her, they do not meet in this arc, 
but there's still time in the future. This fight may actually be my favorite of the arc. It doesn't have any character development or interesting stakes, but goddamn did I miss Frankie, and this whole thing is just One Piece comedy action at its best. Baby Five is a weapon woman or something, and that alone makes for dope visuals, but Frankie's comedy, just shooting at them right away, throwing his shield when he doesn't know what to do, general I'm okay, it's all just so good. Then he smacks him with the general cannon, and he may as well have shot a love arrow into my heart. Frankie's the best, man. Damn. <sighs> what was I talking about? Oh right, the lab is about to collapse and the group is all separated. Law is upset that Luffy launched Caesar as far away as he could instead of capturing him, but I'd say everyone could be equally upset that Law sliced up the entire facility they are all still in. After some dramatic waiting, everyone meets up to escape. This is where we find out that Monet is still alive and has called Doflamingo to let him know what's going on. He wants her to self-destruct the lab and sacrifice herself, which she is already prepared to do. I find it really fascinating the relationship Monet and Doflamingo have. It doesn't feel like Monet necessarily fears Doflamingo, she seems to generally respect him and believe in him as a person, claiming that she knows he will be the king of the pirates. Virgo, Buffalo, and even Baby Five seem to have this reverence for Doflamingo that I don't quite understand yet. He seems to be an absolute maniac, but even in the few glimpses we see of him in this arc with his subordinates, I feel like we do see a different side of him. This scene with Monet in particular really got me to sense that there's more to Doflamingo than we know. Monet goes to push the button, but then her heart gives out before she can. The old heart switcheroo. Law gave Caesar Monet's heart rather than Caesar's heart way, way back before they got captured, and this was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It was such a small detail that wasn't overly beat into our heads, so I had completely forgotten Monet's heart was taken to begin with. When I first saw the scene of Law agreeing to exchange his heart for the secretary, I did have some complaints, but, Caesar going to stab Smoker's heart, only to accidentally kill Monet and actually save everyone, is so perfect that I cannot criticize the setup. And this sets up an even more terrifying moment. Having communication cut off from Baby Five, Buffalo, and Monet, Doflamingo decides to just zoot out of his palace and fly across to Punk Hazard himself, which is such a flex of his power. The fact that we're at the point in this story where characters can essentially fly from island to island is wild just jumps out of the window and is like, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Yikes. Finally, everyone gets out of the lab. The boys all gush about General Frankie, and it still has no impact on the girls. The joke is just too funny every single time. This is when Nami and Usopp get some time to shine. Nami actually used her wind powers to clear the gas surrounding the outside area. Then, when Baby Five and Buffalo snatch the unconscious Caesar and run away, Nami and Usopp step up to take them down in their classically cowardly ways. Nami hits them with some weather shit, and we see a new weapon for Usopp. Now, this is probably my favorite weapon of his since the time skip. He seems to have somehow upgraded Kabuto and gets it to grow like it's a plant, and attached to it he has a plant called Chompgrass, which essentially acts like a shotgun. Pretty fun. With the day saved and Doflamingo on his way, Law urges everyone to leave as quickly as possible, so naturally, we have ourselves a good old fashioned straw hat party, baby. And it's a damn good time. There is a temporary truce between the Straw Hats and the Navy while everyone eats some fine food from the best cook on the sea. It has been a long time since a party like this, and this is the energy that I want. The last party at Fishman Island was weak for me because it didn't really feature a lot of characters interacting, cutting loose, and breaking bread together. This is the first real Straw Hat party since post Ennis Lobby. Thriller Bark was a bit more low key, but I guess you could count it. Either way, I loved this sequence, and Sanji's energy food stuff finally comes into play, and he can juice everyone up. That actually brings me to the reunion between Kinemon and Momonosuke. Kinemon was caught in the gas looking for sun, and once that happened, I knew the gas was not going to actually matter, and once again, everyone we are told was dying would miraculously be okay, because the mass murdering villain is once again bad at mass murdering. But he breaks out of his shell, Momonosuke turns back into a human, and these two tough samurai dudes have a heart to heart. Because of his culture, Momo refused to eat for days and won't eat Sanji's food, but Kinemon starts eating it to show him it's okay, and breaks out in tears over the kindness that they've been shown by these pirates, which was a truly excellent scene. These two were like the most D-plot characters the series has ever done, but it's clear they'll be sticking around for a while, and I'm very excited to learn more about them. 
At the end, they even seem to know a little something about Kato. Which brings me to my next point. While everyone is eating, Smoker and Law sit on the outskirts and get to talking. Smoker questions Law on what his plan is, and specifically why he's taking advantage of Straw Hat, and I think that's another great little moment. Smoker knows Luffy fairly well at this point. Maybe not on a personal level, but they have a strong connection going back to Logtown, and they have shared quite a few adventures together. This just solidifies that despite how Smoker might act, he does have some genuine concern for Luffy's well-being. I promise, I'm not trying to start any new weird fan theories like Croco Mom, but the scene gave me the vibes of a dad asking his daughter's new boyfriend what his intentions are. Smoker just wants to make sure Law isn't taking advantage of Luffy like a sweet daddy. But Law laughs at this saying Luffy might be the one taking advantage of him. It's here we finally flash back to confirm Law wants to take down Kato, and Luffy agreed as long as it wasn't Shanks. He plans to beat all four emperors, which is no surprise, but he doesn't want Shanks to be first. We also get some interesting info that Kato is the strongest of the emperors, which is surprising to me because I figured that had to be Blackbeard since he's been set up as the series' big bad, but We'll see. We wrap up this temporary truce with some nice Navy moments. I think there is a fantastic conversation with Nami and Toshigi, where Toshigi offers to take the children and deliver them home safely. Nami is hesitant, but Toshigi vows with tears in her eyes to keep them safe, and Nami agrees. Later elaborating to Usopp that she has a soft spot for female Navy soldiers, and that was beautiful. I never really think about how Nami's mom was in the Navy and how it would inform how she interacts with a character like Toshigi. It's a small moment, but one that I'm glad was included. It felt like the perfect bow on Nami and Toshigi's arcs in this story. With everyone about to leave, the Navy soldiers begin insulting the pirates to the children until they are stopped by Toshigi, and the soldiers cry out that if they don't insult them, then they might just start liking them. G5 loves the Straw Hats, and they can't even hide it. Honestly, having some sympathetic faces in the Navy could seriously come in handy down the line. Also, at this point, I think that Luffy's relationship with Smoker could be an echo of what Roger's relationship with Garp was like. The Straw Hats sail off with Law, Kinemon, Momo, and Caesar aboard, and move on to the next step of Law's plan, which involves blackmailing Doflamingo. Somehow, Doflamingo didn't make it to Punk Hazard in time because of something called the Sky Path ending. I have no idea what that means, but I guess it could be some kind of in-universe excuse why people can't just fly wherever they want. Luckily enough, he happens upon one of the most badass sights in all of One Piece. Law left Baby Five and Buffalo's severed heads on a dinghy with a transponder snail to both taunt and negotiate with Doflamingo. In exchange for Caesar back, Law wants him to resign from the Warlords, thus putting a massive target on his back and forcing him to give up his rule over Dressrosa, which apparently he spent 10 years working on. I have no idea what this means or why it's so important, but it infuriates Doflamingo, and he goes flying to Punk Hazard and starts taking everyone down, including Thrashing Smoker, until Aokiji shows up to stop him. Aokiji is here! live in that vagabond lifestyle. Doflamingo doesn't want to fuck with him, but now that there are witnesses left alive who know that he's Joker, he claims that he has to change his plan. He resigns from the warlords, abdicates his throne to the surprising dismay of his subjects, and then calls law. So I was not expecting that at all, and I'm truly stunned at the current state of the world here. And with that, Punk Hazard ends as our crew sails for Dressrosa. Punk Hazard is a hard arc for me to pin down because there is so much that I love within it, but most of what I love feels like it's set up for a future storylines rather than any plot details specific to this arc. First of all, let me just say that I'm so, so disappointed nothing happened on the fire side of the island after the beginning. Punk Hazard feels like a wasted setting. It might as well have been a winter island the whole time. Everything involving Caesar, the centaurs, the children, the Yeti Cool Brothers, the slime, etc. all didn't really suck me in. I didn't hate any of it, and there were some things that I really appreciated, but overall, I feel the core aspects unique to Punk Hazard were the weakest part of Punk Hazard. Everything that I loved, that I was eager to see more of, and still am, 
feels like it is only just beginning and will continue into Dressrosa and maybe even beyond. I loved Law's involvement in this story. I loved his weird relationship with Virgo. I loved what we got to see of Joker's underground and what we learned about Virgo's infiltration of the Navy and how that impacted Smoker and Tashigi. Everything having to do with SID, Smile, and Kato feels so utterly massive, like once again the entire world is changing, but generally it has no impact on the Punk Hazard storyline other than learning about it. I mean, now Kiji and Doflamingo at the end of this arc might as well have been a trailer for Dressrosa, and I loved it. Like the island it is set on, the Punk Hazard arc has me split. There were some things that I truly loved, Battle Frankie, and some things that I was meh about, but overall, I guess Punk Hazard is a net positive. There is nothing that I can justify hating, and so much I unabashedly adore that I have to say, Punk Hazard is definitely the best arc since the time skip. This has been one hell of a long video, and I thank you for sticking with it the whole time, you complete lunatics. I'm back covering One Piece, and I'm not going anywhere. In two weeks, my first video on Dress Rosso will release, and if you thought I had a lot to say about Punk Hazard, you ain't seen nothing yet. Likely, I'll have to split my coverage of Dress Rosa across three different videos because the arc is so massive. Brace yourself for what I can only imagine will be me screaming about Doflamingo insanity. Please let me know your thoughts about Punk Hazard down below, and until the next time, I'll shut up.